what we're going to talk about today is IP Anycast and how to implement it with DCOS uh, or Mesos. Everything that I'm showing you here should work equally well with open source like Mesos or DCOS or whatever. Um, so my name is Bill Green. I'm a site reliability engineer at New Relic. And what I'm showing you today is something that we are sort of experimenting with um, in our data center. And I should probably just say from the outset that what I'm going to talk about is, is kind of a silver bullet. It has um, sort of a limited number of use cases. But for those cases, it works pretty well. But I'm hoping that in covering these topics, uh, we'll go over some stuff that's useful anyway, uh, like you know how to do networking and what plugins are and, and things like that. So I'm hoping that you know it's it's useful broadly speaking. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing I guess we should uh, talk about is so what is Anycast? Um, it's one of those terms that you hear a lot, and it's not real. Maybe it's not real clear what it is. So. From a layer two perspective, like on an on a Ethernet LAN or whatever, you have broadcast traffic, and you have unicast traffic, and you have multicast traffic. And so the differences between them are uh, sort of how the addresses are, or how the frames are addressed to stations on the LAN. So broadcast goes to everybody, unicast goes to one station, and multicast goes to a group. Um, and the members of that group can elect themselves to, to be in the group. IP Anycast works at uh, layer three, and it's not so much a feature of, of something. Um, we'll, we'll go into that. Um, so what it is, is, is it's where you have the same IP address that appears in multiple locations in the network. And so you let the routing protocol decide which particular address is going to receive the traffic. And so the way that this sort of works is that the routers you know, keep, uh, have a routing table, and they have the destinations in the routing table. And normally, uh, the routers will pick the closest or the, the lowest metric or you know, some sort of administrative thing to pick one route and put in the routing table, and that's the active route. So even though you may have multiple routes to a destination, the router normally only picks one. Um, with any cast, it actually will make use of multiple routes. And this sort of thing has been in use for a while. And it's, um, if you've ever used like, you know, Google's uh, public resolver, the, the 8.8.8.8, that's, that's an Anycast thing. If you try to hit that IP address, uh, you'll get routed to like the closest, you know, 8.8.8.8 .8 to you, and it's not necessarily the same one every time. So Anycast, like I said, is an effect. It's not a feature. So if you go, you know, thumbing through your, your router manual looking for like how to turn on Anycast, you're not going to find it. Um, the feature is called ECMP, or Equal Cost Multipath. And all that usually is, is it's a little knob in, in the config where you tell the router or the routing protocol, be it BGP or OSPF or you know, whatever uh, routing protocol that you're using, you tell the routing protocol, I want you to use multiple routes. So if, if you can see multiple paths to a particular destination, I want you to use all of them and not just pick the best one, but keep all of those in the routing table. And it will do this if the, the routes are of equal cost. And there's, there's some other uh, details in there. Like if you're running BGP, typically it, it wants to keep um, the same destination AS, but there's knobs to, to override that. This, uh, this little knob for uh, equal cost multipath will apply to BGP, to OSPF, both version 2 and 3. Um, you can use it for MPLS if you're, like, advanced. Um, and it's, it's usually as simple as just uh, going into the, the configuration and saying how many routes you want to use. And the, the router implementation will have limits on the number of equal cost routes that it will do. Um, usually it's on the order of, like, 16, 32, something like that. So you would say, like, under your BGP config, like, I want you to use, like, you know, four routes or whatever. And that will tell it... To, to enable this feature. So uh, a contrived example of this, um, let's say, and I'm, I'm sorry for being US-centric here. Um, my Being an American, I'm, my geography is poor, so I'm going to rely on what I know. 
Uh, so let's pretend like we have SFO, San Francisco, Chicago, New York, and Dallas. But you can imagine like a ring or something around the US. So if you're connected to San Francisco and you want to send something to something in New York, you can go the northern route, so San Francisco, Chicago, New York, or you can go to the southern route, San Francisco, Dallas, New York. So the SFO router will have, you know, in a contrived example, two equal paths to that destination. So if you turn on equal cost multipath in San Francisco, it will, it will put both of those routes in its routing table. And so if it gets a packet from A to B, it will basically load balance or load share uh, on both of those paths. Now, at this point, uh, the astute uh, reader uh, will probably freak out and say, oh my god, how, what if packets you know, get out of order, you know, that kind of thing. So there's implications to doing this. Um, one of them is that e the ECMP will take care of the flows for you, generally speaking. Um, they will hash the destinations using some sort of hashing algorithm. Typically, it's like, they will take the source and destination IPs and ports and sort of hash those together in a group of buckets so that all of the packets in the same flow will go the same route. And this avoids having you know, packets from a, the same flow uh, possibly being reordered if they're going in different paths. Uh, there's usually uh, knobs in the router to affect how this uh, hashing algorithm works. You can sometimes tell it to use um, you know, source destination ports. Sometimes you can go as far down as like the the Ethernet address if if you wanted to. Uh, usually on modern routers, the hashing algorithm is a consistent algorithm, so that if you were if one of these paths becomes unavailable, you don't have to rebalance um, all of these uh, hash you know the hash entries. You only lose the entries for the the link that you lost. Um, and this has implications for things like, um, you know, if you're balancing long-lived flows and things like that, you don't want to disrupt everything if, if you lose one path. And with that, um, you usually don't have to. So um, we're going to talk a little bit now about routing in a data center. So we have, we have this idea of Anycast. And so we have to talk about um, routing in a data center, <clears throat> excuse me, so we know how uh, how to sort of implement it. This is the usual, um, this is the Cisco model that was uh, popular for a long time, and I, it, it still is in, in wide use. And it has the idea of core distribution and access, where you do this aggregation from like, you know, um, a lot of ports at top of rack, and you, you sort of aggregate your traffic as you go north uh, in the data center and, and so forth. Um, this is, uh, this is not really a design that will scale. Um, it does have some benefits, like it's optimized to lower the per port cost at your top of rack. That's really what it's uh, designed to do. The drawbacks of this are pretty much everything else. Um, it, it is really hard to scale this. It's expensive. Um, it's usually, there's usually a lot of layer two involved, so you get these really uh, large broadcast domains, um, which are sometimes hard to troubleshoot. The alternative to doing it this way is with a, a so-called spine leaf topology. This is the more, um, I'm gonna say modern way to do it. Uh, this is um, becoming more popular in a data center. So what you do in this sort of design is you have your top of rack and, and you have a, a spine layer that's sort of your core and everything talks BGP. So that each, each of your racks then become an autonomous system and they're, they're kind of like their own little ISP or their own little network. And so all of these things become little islands that exchange routing information with the spine as if the spine were the internet provider of these, these racks. And it, at first glance, it seems kind of crazy to do something like this, but the advantages of doing this are that BGP is a very robust uh, protocol. It's been in use forever. It's very mature. It's well understood. Um, and it's actually very simple to configure. It's generally as simple as just naming a route and saying, hey, I have this route, I want you to export this to everyone else, and it, and it, it will go do that. And so the, the topological features here are that you have uh, usually um, a grouping of spines that follow a power of two. So you'll have like two, four, you know, eight, 16 spines. And each top of rack is connected to each one of the spines. 
And equal cost multipath routing is used throughout a design like this. And what, what ends up happening is that at the top of rack there, if you can imagine that these are 10 gig links, you have an aggregate bandwidth of 40 gigs out of the top of rack, and it's load balanced among these different paths. And if you lose one of those links, the traffic will just shift over to the remaining three. So in the case of a failure, you just end up degrading your bandwidth a little bit. And you, you have like a numbers game where, where you can support a maximum number of racks based on the port density of your spine. Typically, these are on the order of like 96 ports or something like that. So on a spine layer, you, you'd support like 100 a, a racks, basically. And you would oversubscribe the bandwidth in your racks by like an order of maybe three to one or something, where you might have you know, 40 gigs aggregate out of your top of rack. And in, in your rack, you might have 30 servers connected um, you know, at, at one gig each or something like that. So there, there's some oversubscription here, so it requires you, you, know, you kind of be judicious about um, how you provision these things. So from a, um, oh, sorry. Uh, so the spine leaf topology, so it's layer three everywhere. You could do OSPF. The more common that I've seen is BGP. Usually the, this is uh, eBGP, so it's external. So every, every sort of thing here is, is an autonomous system among itself, and it sort of like peers with everybody. Um, the benefits are uh, a massive scale out. You can sort of see here that Everything, every rack becomes one hop away. So it tends to equalize your latency um, so that every, you don't have these crazy, you know, where you go all the way up to the top and back down to reach, you know, in, in, a, in a sort of more uh, core access distribution model. You don't have to go all the way up through that stack and back down. Each hop is basically just one bounce off the spine layer. And so it's very low latency. Um, and like I said with BGP, it's simple, it's robust, it's mature. So what does this look like? Well, you have like your top of racks, you have your ASs, and so you might have something like this where each rack is an AS. Um, so you can actually bring this down to the host if you wanted to. You can run a BGP daemon on the host, and you can have the host in its own AS. And then what you do is for everything that runs on the host, you just simply announce a host route for that thing. Now your thing can be a container, it can be a service, it can be whatever. Um, and then in this way, as your services come and go, the routes are announced and withdrawn. And so this sort of saves you from having to do like a load balancer to keep track of where everything is or do like complicated service discovery schemes to maintain, you know, to, to understand where your stuff is. But what does this look like as far as Docker goes? Because this is, this is where the hard part comes in. So in a typical Docker um, deploy, um, like you know, your, your, your standard install of Docker, you, you usually run this in a layer two bridge. And what this is, is inside the Linux kernel, you get a bridge um, device, and you have a Docker zero there, and you allocate uh, these interfaces in pairs. So you might spin up a container, you would allocate a namespace to the container, so the container gets its own copy of the network stack, and then you build uh, a virtual Ethernet pair, and you give one end to the container, and then you give one end to the kernel, and that's how you talk across the namespace, is you, you do that kind of thing. You can either, and this is just a point-to-point -point link, doing this bridge topology thing, where you give one side to the container and one side into the kernel, that's no different from like a T1 link or something where you're like linking a remote office. It's exactly the same thing except in this case you're not routing it, you're bridging it, so this is layer two. So in the kernel you collect all of these virtual ethernet interfaces that go out to your various containers and you put them in a bridge. This is just like a layer two switch. So it's like you're, you're you know, taking all of these remote offices or whatever and you're putting them on a switch so that you have a layer two and you, you, you know, uh, send the frames everywhere and there's some kernel trickery that, that comes into this. But this is basically what you have. And the most, uh, the important point is that all of the IP addresses that get allocated to the container come out of the same IP block. So this is like you would, uh, Docker usually gives like 172.17, you know, uh, in this case it's like 0 0.1, and so every container gets an IP address on this network. We can't use this to announce uh, 
via BGP mainly because we'd, we'd have to announce the entire network. We would not be able to like go down to the, to the individual layers of the Docker containers because there's only one interface here in the kernel, and that's Docker Zero. So you would have to either announce that you have all of the containers or none of them. And so if one or two or three of your containers are not reachable, you would black hole, you would announce that you have them even though you don't. So what we want instead for this Anycast scheme is we want what I just showed you, except we want it routed. We want to, we want to still give every container its own namespace. We want to make a pair of virtual ethernets. We want to give one to the container and keep one but we want to route it. We don't want to bridge it. And the reason why we want to route it is because these become host routes. So instead of having a bridge network, we have these slash 32s, which means they're just routes to a host. And these routes go in the kernel table on the host. And whenever you have routes in a kernel table, you can then redistribute those via the BGP daemon into the rest of your network. And then as containers come and go, these interfaces go down and, and come up or whatever, and these host routes appear and disappear, and thus they're announced and withdrawn from the network. So this is, this is what we want to have. And this allows us to, we, you can do uh, IP per container this way. So if you, if you have some, some IPAM scheme where you want to you know, assign IP addresses to containers, you can do this. But in our case, we want to assign the same IP address to a group of containers. So we want to take you know, um, Marathon, and we want to deploy you know, n copies of an application with Marathon. We want each one of those instances to come up with this exact same IP address in different parts of the network. And then we want this, this IP address to be announced into the network so that all of the routers see multiple paths to the same destination or what they believe is the same destination, but in reality, it's multiple containers. So that's, that's what we're trying to achieve with this. So the question is, how do we do this? And so that's sort of the heart of this. So we have this idea of plugins with both Docker and with Meso. So if you're not using the Docker plugin, or sorry, if you're not using a Docker containerizer, if you're instead using the Mesos uh, universal containerizer, this works in a very similar way. And so on a, on, a on a Mesos or DCOS platform, you have your choice of two different containerizers. In both of these cases, you can write plugins for this containerizer to customize the functionality that you want. And they work a little bit differently, but the end result is the same. Sort of, so in the, in the Docker scheme, they, they have what's called the container network model. And this is basically farmed out to a thing called libnetwork. And so in this case, you have a plugin driver that runs in a container on the host. And its job is to listen to API calls from Docker to do things. And these things are. Um, you know, I need an address. I, I want you to create a new network. You know, I have, you know, I want you to release the address. So Docker makes these various calls, and your, the custom plugin uh, actually does the work to do this. And so this, this container, this Docker plugin, is just an HTTP service. It's no more complicated than that. So you, your, your plugin is an HTTP service. It runs as a container on the Docker host, and Docker talks to it over HTTP. Now, generally, this is via a Unix socket and not a network socket, because you don't generally want to make this available to the, to the entire network. <clears throat> and in the container network interface, which is sort of like Kubernetes and uh, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the universal containerizer, that's what this uses. And it's, it's a similar scheme, except it doesn't run as an HTTP service. It's an executable. And so the containerizer in this case just execs the executable and passes it arguments uh, both via uh, standard in and with environment variables. But it's the same sort of thing. It makes requests of the plugin and says, hey, I have a thing. I want you to create me a network. I want you to assign an IP address, et cetera. Uh, the other difference here is there's really two parts to this. There's the network driver and there's the IPAM driver. And I'm, I'm going to gloss over the IPAM driver, but this is what uh, actually uh, allocates the network. 
or allocates the IP address and so forth. And it's sort of assumed if you have a custom IPAM driver that you have a larger IPAM implementation in your organization. Typically, organizations like to centralize IP management for obvious reasons. So like if you're going to do the IPAM driver, that's, you kind of, that's how you get it plugged into the rest of your, your organization. For the, these purposes, I'm going to assume that when you spin up a container, you're just going to tell it what IP address you want it to use. And so it sort of bypasses the IPAM driver. But you need to know that both of these plugins deal with that a little differently. The Docker plugin, um, there's, there's two separate drivers. There's the network driver and the IPAM driver. With CNI, there's only the, the containerizer only talks to the network part, and the network part is expected to talk to the IPAM driver on behalf of Docker. But it, the functionality is the same. It's just it works a little different in how the calls are made. So, Ultimately, what, what we want to do is we want to you know, have a routed network. So this is where we start. So usually the plugin is given a container, and the container is just a bare bones implementation of you know, some sort of running process, and it has its own namespace. So what I'm trying to show you here is the dark blue is the namespace on the host, the light blue is the namespace in the container. And so the steps that you generally follow are you take this, and you, was, you make a virtual Ethernet pair. And again, this is what we're doing in the driver. So the first step in the driver is you create the virtual Ethernet pair. And one end is going to go in the container. The other end is going to go on the host. You assign a dummy MAC address pair to assign to the, the virtual Ethernet pair. And you take the IP address, and you assign uh, the IP address to the interface. In this case, we're using the 169.254 on the host side. This is a link local address, and it sort of gives us a way to route, um, to, to basically do a route to an interface, and I'll, I'll cover that in a minute. But the host, the host side of this is always going to be that exact same address. And then what we do is um, we make routes on both of these. So in, in the host side, we take the host route of the container and we add that to the routing table so that the host now knows how to route to the container side. In the container, we need two routes. We need a route that's, a, that's an interface route, and we take the link local and we say, OK, this link local address can be reached by putting it on this link. And then we make a second route that's a default route, and we point it at the link local address. And this gets us out of the container. And so this allows us to route out. In order for this scheme to work, you have to have proxy ARP enabled um, in, on the host for at least the interfaces that are coming up. And it's not usually an issue to do that, but you do have to enable that. And so at the end of all this, this is what we have. We have containers that are coming up with each container having an IP address. The route to the container is contained in the host routing table. You run a BGP daemon on the host that redistributes these um, addresses out to the rest of the network. And so what I'm showing you here is these 192 addresses. These are the addresses that your host uh, is, is numbered in. So these are the, this is the address space in your rack that you would have. So each host is going to get like a 192 address. But inside the host, the individual containers are going to have a different IP address, and it's going to be a host route. And that the way that you tell the rest of the network that to route to your containers is you have to have the BGP peered with the rest of your network to tell it that you have these routes. So if you have this scheme, it will all just sort of work. So sort of the use cases for this. So why, why would you ever want to do this? Um, there's a couple reasons why you would want to do this. One of the reasons is... Um, for like UDP endpoints. So like if you're running a syslog service, if you, you know, if you want to be able to, you know, just send your logs to somewhere and uh, you don't really, um, you know, if you have a few syslog services scattered around your network or whatever, or if you have multiple data centers, you might run a logging service in each data center, you would want to be able to give, you know, an IP address into your host to be able to log to this stuff. And so what you would do is you would configure your log service with an anycast address so that all of your log um, collectors would have the exact same IP address, and your host will use whichever one is topologically closer. So that if you're in a data center, let's say, your host would tend to use the log aggregator that's in, your, in that same data center. But if somehow you lose that one, you'll still hear the routes from the other data centers, and so it'll go to those. 
um, instead. It also works for things like, um, you know, like I mentioned, DNS uh, will do this. For, like, it works really well for SFlow, for NetFlow, um, which are all UDP-based services. But you can also use it for TCP services. There's not a restriction here. So what you can do, which is kind of interesting, is you can deploy um, HA proxy. And so uh, the, what you can sort of do is you can, you can deploy your service. Like if you have a web service or whatever, what you do is you deploy that and you use um, Minuteman, if you're using DCOS, to give it um, an IP address that's normally only reachable inside your cluster. So that Minuteman assigns you know, some sort of dummy address and you get a host-based VIP for your service. So that you can run you know, three copies of your, of your HTTP service and you could put those behind a Minuteman VIP. And if, as long as you're in the cluster, that totally works great. But then the problem comes from like, what if you're outside the cluster? And so the usual uh, solution for this is um, Marathon LB or, or something similar, where you run like an HA proxy. So that relies on this sort of kooky scheme where you're like having to reload HA proxy like every time something changes. And you know, HA proxy was never designed to do this. And they've gotten better about it, but I. I still am kind of wary of doing stuff like that. So a better case, I think, is to just deploy an HA proxy container and assign the front end, like you know, your server side of the HA proxy, an anycast address, and the back side becomes that named uh, Minuteman VIP, and it's static, and that config never needs to change. And so you deploy you know, three copies of this with anycast, and it gets deployed, and so your, your HA proxy becomes globally reachable from anywhere. And if your containers move around, Minuteman will take care of you know, updating the, you know, the actual container instances. But the HA proxy instance never needs to change. Um, you could do this with, um, like if you're running tra you know, traffic or you know, any kind of uh, load balancer that follows that kind of pattern, you can deploy with any cast. Now, the caveat to this comes from uh, what happens when you lose um, you know, when you lose one of those equal cost multipath routes, because the routers do have to rebalance those flows that you lose when you lose one of these routes, and that causes the connections to be reset for just, just the flows that we're using that one route. The other thing is that if you deploy HA proxy using an IP anycast address, you lose the ability to gracefully take your HA proxy instances out for maintenance. So if you wanted to do something like this, you would have to take the HA proxy instance down and it would reset all of the connections that are on there and they would be forced to use, to reconnect to another HA proxy instance. So as long as you've got applications that are willing to tolerate that, it works well. If you've got stuff that won't tolerate that or you've got, or you know, you're sending like large files or something via post or something like that where to reset these connections is problematic. You don't want to do this because you'll run into issues. Um, so that's, that's the sort of high level. Um, I glossed over uh, a lot of the details, but what I wanted to show you, I guess I'm not going to be able to do that. So there's a, I'll put on the slide deck when I upload it, there's, um, there's a repo from Medallia on uh, GitHub that actually does the Docker plugin that will enable uh, the routed plugin, and it works out of the box. You can just deploy it, and as long as you use that as your Docker network driver, it'll divvy out these, um, these host routes. So if you have a setup like this in your data center where you're running BGP or something else, and if you're set up to where you can take um, your host and peer it with the rest of your network, it's really easy to do this. You just need to run a plugin, um, and the plugin is called C CNM Routed Plugin, and you would just run this on your host, and you would divvy out these host routes, and suddenly your containers would be reachable from everywhere in the network. And you, you wouldn't necessarily even have to use any cast. Like I mentioned, if you have like an IP per container scheme, you could do this also, and so it would make your IP addresses for your container reachable everywhere also. So that's kind of uh, the gist of the talk. Um, I wanted to, to open it up for questions because I realized I sort of went through this fast. So. Uh.
So if, in other words, like if you've got four of the same IP address in one rack and one over here, since the hosts are doing the announcement, the, the top of rack would get all four of those host routes and it would announce those. So everywhere in the network, you're just gonna see five routes. Four of them happen to go to the top of rack. Are you thinking about ag aggregation? So if, if they're on the same host in the rack, that's probably not gonna work because It will if you tell it to. So that, that's a thing. Like normally, normally with, a, with a sort of garden variety networking, you want to aggregate that stuff, right? You don't want all these little really specific routes leaked out everywhere because you end up with these gigantic routing tables. So typically, you would have something on the, on the router that's like, um, you know, aggregate supernet or something like that, where the router will all automatically take these more specific routes and aggregate them behind a single ad aggregation. And as long as one or more of these more specifics are reachable, this route stays uh, announced. And you don't have to do that. You can, you can specifically say, hey, if you've got anything in this net block, just go ahead and announce the, the 32s into the network. Yeah, so, uh, so the question was, like, if, you, if you're using generally, like, IP per container and you're announcing all these slash 32s, like, what's the limit to that? Um, you, you don't want to have, like, 60,000 containers in a data center all announcing these host routes into your network. It's sort of understood that you're going to have, you know, a small, little bit smaller implementation than that. Uh, but generally speaking, you're going to run out of IP addresses before you run out of, you know, this kind of thing. I even if you're using private addresses, if you have these just mass, like if you're Facebook, um, you're going to, you know, doing IP per container is going to be very, very difficult because even if you're using private addresses, um, it's going to get very difficult to, to divvy that stuff out. One more question. Um, maybe two more. Go ahead. In the implementation I showed you, yes. Now, you, you could always get around that by, you know, I don't know, you, you could probably use net filter trickery uh, to get around that. But gen generally, like, the kernel is going to make that decision. So if the kernel has that route and it's local, yeah, it, it'll use whatever local thing. I, I don't know of an instance where you'd want it to go out of the rack. Can you, can you think of a, like, a, what's the use case? Oh. Yeah, yeah, right. So, like, if you have, like, a bunch of stuff in that rack that needs to talk to that one thing, um, yeah, you would have that issue. You'd have to put multiple things in that rack to sort of share the load in that case. It, it, it gets really hard to sort of granularly, like, do this kind of stuff with this scheme because it's not, it's not really meant for load balancing in that sense. It, it'll, it'll, like, load share and not load balance if, if that's, like, a, a thing. Is, is there one more question? Like, yeah. Um, so you, it depends on how your IPAM is, right? So you can uh, have your IPAM do your DNS for you. So if you wanted to, you can name these things. And so you would have an IP address with a name. And so in your service, you know, in your configs, you would inject the host name. And so the host name would just, you would use DNS as your service discovery. Or you could use Mesos DNS or console or, or whatever. But, but the IPAM that I sort of glossed over, that's, that's where all of that happens, is like how you get that into the larger discovery um, thing, generally. And we're out of time. Um, thank you very much for attending. Um, I know it was kind of a very dense talk, but I, I hope it was useful.